Frank Volak is a professor of economics at Stanford University. His fields of specialization are industrial organization and econometric theory. His recent work studies methods for introducing competition into infrastructure industries like uh, telecommunications, electricity, water, delivery, and postal delivery services, and on assessing the impacts of these competition policies on consumer and producer welfare. So Frank uh, was also a chair of the Market Surveillance Committee of the California Independent System Operator for Electricity Supply. Uh, he is a member of the Emissions Market Advisory Committee for California's Market for Greenhouse Gas Emissions Allowances. And he has an impressive list of publications I will not detail here. So today we'll present a work on the role of financial market participants in improving wholesale electricity market performance. Welcome, Frank. Well, th thank you very much, Claude, and that was far too long an introduction. I asked for a very short one, but Claude refused. But okay, because I like as much time as possible to talk. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to talk about is uh, essentially a much maligned group of participants in energy markets in general uh, and electricity markets, and these are what we could call purely financial participants. Uh, this is sort of why I think they're at least the popular public view of financial market participants or you could say as traders. They, they essentially, you know, they buy something they have no intention of consuming and sell something that they can't produce. All they do is, you know, attempt to buy low, sell high, or they can essentially sell first, buy back later, short sales, which are even, even worse. Uh, these are typically, you know, termed, at least in the press, speculators or, and, you know, the big, the big issue always is, is that these financial participants are taking money away from producers that produce the product and consumers that purchase the product. The, but it, this is the, the sort of popular view. This is a, a recent article in the New York Times that uh, essentially talked about how, you know, as, as the power grid is becoming overworked, uh, the, there are traders making lots of money. But uh, I think the important point is what I have here in print this in, in, in italics is, is that none of these profitable trades that these traders are doing are necessarily riskless. They, they all involve the traders taking on risk. Here's another one for, for those of you who uh, might find of interest. This is actually a website that was started uh, by one of the traders that uh, sort of run afoul of the political process. Uh, and decided that they wanted, they were going to fight it. And so what they did is they set up this website where they essentially uh, sort of are pleading their case in the court of public opinion because, it, you know, for those of you who know anything about American sports, you might know about uh, Tom Brady and the whole deflate gate. So in other words, the idea being that it's a similar thing here is that uh, uh, FERC is sort of the, uh, if you like, the commissioner of the NFL and these guys aren't too happy, so they, they are trying to go to the court of public opinion on this. So what, 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 I, what I really want, try, want to try to say is, look, uh, the, you know, these financial participants are no different, I think, from any other uh, participants in the sense that they are, they are basically doing what we'd like them to do, which is trying to make a return on investment, uh, serve the fiduciary responsibility of their shareholders, and at least the way I like to think about it is that, look, you know, just like, uh, just like essentially designers of buildings and aircrafts need to worry about gravity, uh, we as designers of markets need to worry about essentially these so-called laws of economics, which is, you know, this think, think of as just simply the incentive constraint. And uh, regulators that deny the, the, the existence of this law sort of do so at their own peril. Uh, and, you know, I think that oftentimes what we're attributing is these undesirable outcomes are really not, you know, nefarious behavior, but in many ways the result of a poorly designed market. But I think a well-designed market and what we're moving towards, at least I think throughout the United States, is a fairly well-designed electricity market, is that uh, trade financial participants exploiting these profitable opportunities I think really can deliver benefits, and that's the purpose of what I want to talk about today, is essentially uh, one such example of this. It's, it's coming from uh, the, the introduction of what's called uh, convergence bidding, or if really I think the more appropriate word, but certainly politically incorrect word, uh, which is uh, con uh, virtual trading. 
uh, and it's virtual trading because you're trading, if you like, virtual megawatts. You're not really trading megawatts that you know you're going to be able to deliver because remember what I told you about traders is they sell something they don't uh, produce and they buy something they don't consume. So clearly uh, they're not going to uh, do anything but just uh, trade differences between the various markets. And so the first is, is that um, uh, what I want to talk about is really this, uh, the idea of the, um, within the context of the California electricity market, but this is true of a number of other markets, introduced, uh, there are what are called multi-settlement markets. And these markets are essentially where you can buy firm financial commitments day ahead, which you can then sell back in real time. Uh, and in, in, April, in February of 2011, California implemented convergence bidding. And so what I'm going to talk about is based on a paper on, on my website uh, that uh, looks at this question. So the, the, the idea that we want to really want to look at is this idea that in these kinds of markets where you have risk neutral traders, you, you get this relationship if you have zero transactions costs. But in most of these markets, and in particular the other thing that's definitely true about these uh, virtual bidding markets is that these are, if you like, politically unfavored markets. And so a lot of costs get layered on to the convergence bidders. And so if what you're doing is making an assessment of this, the, the, whether or not this relationship holds, there really is both an explicit as well as, I think, implicit cost of trading. And so the real idea of whether or not um, you know, profitable trading opportunity exists is whether or not, if you like, the, the absolute value of the difference between those two things uh, is greater than the, tra the round trip transactions cost. Not necessarily that that, that, that expectation is zero, simply because there are, there are per unit uh, costs. And so one of the things that makes this, an, I think, an interesting paper is recognizing the existence of trading costs. And then what we're going to do is essentially assess whether or not when you introduce this new product, virtual bidding, did the sort of implicit cost of transacting uh, to, to essentially exploit this difference between day ahead, that's the forward price, and the short-term spot price, S, did the cost of exploiting that fall? And so that's one thing we want to look at. The other thing we want to look at is the idea that one of the things we think about with forward markets and, and multi-settlement is that the forward market is setting up the spot market to essentially clear, if you like, in as painless a manner as possible. So we would expect that the variance of the real-time prices should reduce as a result of the convergence bidders. I mean, the way I like to think about what convergence bidding is doing is really just the classic information aggregation. What we're doing is we're allowing all these financial market participants to effectively provide their input as to what they think the least cost way to dispatch the system in real time is, whereas before, without the financial market participants, we were essentially saying only those that own generation or serve load can make these guesses. Uh, but with the introduction of the purely financial participants, you're giving them this ability to provide their information, their specialized knowledge. So we'd expect both the variance of real-time prices as well as the variance of the difference between day ahead and real-time prices. Because remember, in a multi-settlement market, if real-time looks just like day ahead, we should have almost zero variance. And then finally, the other is just the, the fact that there are systematic differences in this price difference across time. So the other thing we're going to look at is just uh, did this uh, to the autocorrelation in that price process. And then the other thing we want to look at is essentially the efficiency of market outcomes. Since one of the things that certainly I, I will, in full disclosure, say that I was a shameless advocate of virtual bidding as a member of the Market Surveillance Committee of the California ISO, and this was the reason why. It's because of this idea that you're giving all participants the opportunity to, to have an input into what is the least cost way to dispatch the system. So the question is, is that do we see that in terms of market outcomes, meaning do we do we see a lower cost of dispatch as well as essentially less, if you like, heat energy being used to provide the electrical energy that actually comes, to, comes out of the grid? So in order to, to, kind of, to set the stage for this, I need to give at least uh, everybody some background on U.S. wholesale electricity markets. So the two things uh, I'll try to explain at least briefly are essentially what we'll call multi-settlement as well as essentially locational marginal pricing. 
which I know in Europe is absolute evil, but in the United States it's, it's considered the, the sort of market design of choice. In fact, all U.S. markets are, are essentially LMP markets at the moment. So, so essentially, what happens in the LMP market is you take all of the unit-specific bids from all the generation units at all of their locations, and you, you, you minimize, as it says right here, the as-bid cost to serve demand at all locations in the transmission network, subject to all relevant operating constraints, transmission, uh, ramp rates, you, you name it. Whatever constraint you want to put in, it's solving a large optimization problem. The LMP is essentially the, if you like, the optimized value of the objective function. How does that change as a result of withdrawing one more unit of output at that location? Uh, and what we get from the day ahead market is essentially schedules uh, of, of generation units and prices. And those schedules are, as I said, firm financial commitments, which means you get paid for what you sell in the day ahead market, uh, regardless of what you do in real time. It's just that it has financial consequences uh, come real time, as we'll discuss. So then, between day ahead and real time in most markets, you're able to uh, essentially revise your offer curves based upon what you think might be uh, the uh, changes in system conditions, and then you run the process in real time. So you essentially determine you do five minute dispatch every five minutes within the hour in real time uh, to essentially, and what you're again doing the same thing. You're solving that same optimization problem. You're, you, you're updating the transmission network for effectively the conditions that exist uh, in each of those intervals. Uh, just like in the day ahead, you used your best guess of what you thought the real time conditions in the grid would be. And then what, what happens is, is that the hourly real time prices then are just simply the arithmetic average of the 12 uh, 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 LMPs that occur in, in, in that hour, okay? So, and you know, as we said, the hourly, the, the hourly real-time prices are certainly more volatile than the day-ahead prices simply because of, you know, limited flexibility, but also, uh, you know, in part, you know, market power sorts of issues as well. So, as, we, as I said, the, the, the way that the settlement works is that you get paid, but, if you don't cover it with what you scheduled as a generator, you're on the hook. So if I only produce 30, I gotta buy 10 out of the real-time market to replace the schedule that I had of, of 40 from the day ahead market, similarly for the load serving entity. All right, so, and, and so the, what happens is, is that, you know, what I can do is essentially, as a generator or supplier, is I can play day ahead versus real-time differences. And this is what was at least initially called implicit virtual bidding. So if I, as a supplier, uh, think that the day ahead price is lower than the real time price, then what I'm going to do is probably you know, bid higher in the day ahead price or just withhold my output, not even bid it into the day ahead market, and then sell it in real time. Or similarly, if I'm a load serving entity and I think the day ahead price <clears throat> is more expensive than real time, then what I'll do is I may not schedule all my energy, I may not bid it all in in the day ahead, and just purchase in real time. And you know what this did was create some significant reliability consequences, which uh, uh, essentially you know there would be times, uh, certainly in in a, in a number of markets, where you know a significant amount of energy would be delayed until real time. The operators would get a little nervous. So virtual bidding was essentially introduced as a way to essentially say, look. If you expect that those two prices are going to be equal, you should just bid your energy into the day ahead market because you know there's no advantage to you delaying which market you bid into. Virtual bidding is a way to essentially achieve that at the, at the first stage. So how does virtual bidding work? Well, what you do is you as a virtual bidder, you can submit if in, in a generation bid just like a physical generation unit you can submit that at any location in the grid that you want, and you'll be treated in the day ahead market just like a generator, okay? And, uh, but if you're taken in the day ahead market, then there is a financial commitment that you will be a price taker in the real time market to essentially purchase that power uh, uh, you know, back in the real time market. Okay. Similarly, if you submit a demand bid in the day ahead market, you'll be treated just like a load serving entity, okay? but what you're then going to be required to do for the amount that you sell is you're going to sell that back in, in real time. And so what you can see is if I 
in, if I put a debt bid in in the day ahead market, I'm increasing demand at that location, which is likely to increase the price. If I put in an ink bid in the day ahead market, I'm going to increase supply at that location, which is going to presumably depress the price. Both of, and you know, per the reason that I'm doing that is because I think that I want to essentially sell at the real, uh, I want to essentially, I want to exploit that price, sorry, exploit that price difference. So the thing, the other thing about explicit virtual bids is they are identified to the system operator as such. So in other words, I as the ISO, I see these virtual bids come in. When they clear, I know that they're virtual bids uh, and I know what's going to happen to them in real time. And, and the other is, is that financial participants can virtual bid. Anyone that wants to can virtual bid. There's some problems in most of the U.S. markets in the sense that the public utilities commissions that effectively regulate the, the retail side of the market tend to frown on the retailers uh, that are serving load to virtual bid, which has some problems. But, but for the most part, if you want to set up shop as a, as a virtual bidding trader, you post your bond and you can do it. Okay, so um, why would we expect that virtual bidding to reduce these sorts of trading costs and improve price convergence? Well, the first thing is, is that essentially I can only implicit virtual bid as a generator over the range of my generation unit, okay? Uh, and, and they can only implicitly virtual bid where I own a generation unit, okay? Similarly, the way it works in California is that load serving entities can only bid within the range of their expected demand. I can't bid into the day ahead market a demand level that's far above my demand. The system operator will certainly uh, prohibits me from doing that or at least, uh, uh, and so, you know, effectively the other thing that's true is that in California is you as a utility, you only bid at your service territory level rather than you bid at the node level. And so what this really does is prevents uh, uh, load serving entities, at least in California, from I implicitly virtually bidding at load nodes. So in other words, generators could implicit virtual bid at generation nodes in the early days before explicit virtual bidding, but load nodes couldn't. So we might expect that, if, if you like, the cost, the transactions cost associated with virtual bidding at load nodes would be higher initially rather than the transactions cost associated with uh, bidding at the generation nodes initially, and we'll, we'll investigate that, that one empirically as well. Okay, so the other is, is that why would we expect that it would improve market performance? And this just simply has to do with the fact that what we discussed, which is, you know, if there are, you know, there could be long start units, I want to make sure that long start unit gets on. I can essentially, to make sure my long start unit gets committed as a generator, I could submit a deck bid at that location to essentially make sure that the demand level is high enough so that long start unit gets committed as opposed to a short start unit that, that effectively would, excuse me, be more expensive to run in real time, set a higher real time price. And so what we could expect is, is and as well, it's just the fact that I think the important thing to remember is that, you know, in an LMP market, there are thousands of constraints. Uh, you know, and one of the things that we think markets do a very good job of is solve very, very complex optimization problems. And believe me, this is one of the, one of the most complex optimization problems I can think of, which is essentially how to most efficiently dispatch a system in real time. And we could think of that, you know, what the virtual bidders are doing is through, if you like, just their desire to exploit these locational price differences, they are presumably uh, yielding a dispatch that is lower cost than would be the case if they weren't trying to do that. Okay, so the two things we're going to investigate is essentially this idea of closing the gap, reducing this trading cost, um, and you know, the, it's, as I said, it's not equal to zero, but it's equal to this, the, the absolute value is less than this trading cost, and so we'd expect that more, you know, more accurate scheduling the other thing that and we would expect from that is both this, this implicit trading cost that we talk about to fall, as well as we'd expect this variance of the real time and the day ahead prices to fall. Then the other thing we, we'd expect is that this sort of dynamic to be working is that the virtual bidders that essentially are good at essentially anticipating where real time demand and supply is needed, 
they're going to be rewarded with profits, and that's going to create this incentive for them to essentially produce the least cost mix of demands. So we're going to look at both this improved price convergence and market efficiency for California. So what do we do? We use the hourly prices. And, I, and first, we'll just do it at the lap level because essentially there are three laps in California. These are essentially the service territories of the utilities, and each lap price is computed as essentially the nodal load weighted average of the LMPs in each of the firm's service territory. And then I'm gonna, we'll present some summary results for the nodal levels just to show you that what we did at the lap level is very representative of what's true at the nodal level. And as I said, all generation units are paid their nodal price. Uh, there's you know, over 5,000 nodes in, in, in California. So, and this is uh, essentially the lap levels of each of the things. So the different colors, San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, SCE, Pacific Gas and Electric. These are the various locations of the nodes. And so think of it as what you're doing to get the lap price for PG&E is you're taking the weighted average of all load nodes in their service ter territory. For SCE, you're doing the same thing. So what we've done here is essentially computed the, um, in each of these graphs, just to show you, is for each hour of the day, we've computed the average, sample average over that two-year period, a year before the implementation of virtual bidding uh, versus, and then a year after virtual bidding, we've computed the hourly average before virtual bidding, and then the point-wise 95% confidence interval on that price difference. So, the, so right here is the price difference for the first hour, the second hour, and so on. And then over here, same thing. And the thing you can see is, is, is basically there are certainly large devi deviations of the 95% confidence interval over here. They get a little better. This does it for Southern California Edison. You can see it gets a little better uh, for them as well. San Diego, you can see it gets a little better. That's pre versus post uh, explicit virtual bidding. But if you did the test of whether or not the all these means are zero. In other words, just the standard 24-dimensional chi-squared test. In both cases, you reject. True, the statistic would be lower. But you know, I think this really points to the fact that that's the, that's the wrong way to think about it, because there are explicit trading costs, as well as implicit trading costs, associated with essentially trading this difference. And so the right way we, we think about it is to say, OK, let's think of it in terms of essentially an economic model. And the economic model goes like this, is we say, OK, there's a trader, and he's got access to these 24 assets. So think of this as the vector of, of, of price differences across hours of the day. And what he does is he essentially he has expected trading costs, which is essentially the portfolio weights times the mean of those price differences. Those portfolio weights can be positive or negative. Positive means buy one, sell the other. Negative means sell one, buy the, buy the other in terms of real, uh, real time versus day ahead. And then what we have is essentially the trading costs. The trading costs are assessed on the absolute value of the position that you take. And then C is, if you like, sort of is the trading cost. And then what we have is essentially just the fact that we're going to impose the normalization that the sum of the absolute positions that you take is equal to 1. And therefore, what the trader wants to do is essentially maximize expected profit. So the idea that we're about is to say, OK, the, let, let essentially this guy A star equal the expected profit maximizing portfolio given the vector of weights. And what we're interested in saying is that is essentially the uh, different between that expected profit maximizing portfolio in C greater than zero versus the alternative that it's not, okay? And, and so this, 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 you might look just like a, a, a sort of application of the delta method, but the problem is, is that this function phi of mu is, is not differentiable. So essentially the conventional delta method doesn't work, but what it turns out to be is essentially directionally differentiable. And there's some recent work by uh, Fang and Santos that essentially shows how to compute the, uh, at least an estimate of the asymptotic distribution of that. And what we do is essentially uh, bar employ their method, which was essentially uh, turned into this uh, essentially numerical derivative based approach by Hong and Lee. So what we come up with is essentially two, two values, which is what we call is we use this distribution to say, OK, what's the smallest value of this implicit trading cost that causes us to reject the null hypothesis that 
that a profitable trading charge exists. The other one is we can compute is the largest value of C that causes, not rejective, but rejection, sorry, of the null hypothesis that no profitable trading strategy exists, right? So in other words, if this is inequality is, is satisfied, then no profitable trading strategy exists. And so what we, we come up with is essentially those values uh, using this, this procedure. Um, the other thing we do is, as you can see, we considered a pretty simple trading strategy, which is based only on essentially the, the, the sort of mean and the, and the, uh, and the, of the, of the uh, price difference vector. But the interesting thing is that we then look to see if there's autocorrelation. So one of the things to, important to bear in mind is that, remember, when you're submitting your bids for the next day in the day ahead market, the real-time market for today is operating. So essentially, there is first order autocorrelation in the price difference vector, meaning the price difference between the day ahead price and the real time price for today, and the price difference for the real time price and the day ahead price for, say, tomorrow. There is first order autocorrelation that you can't, sub you can't exploit simply because when you're submitting your bids, that, that still has not been resolved. And so essentially, what we expect is there to be first order autocorrelation. But beyond that, we want to see whether or not there's any remaining autocorrelation to be exploited. And so we have this uh, test of whether, you know, out to, in, in our case, we go out to lag 10, and we essentially find there's very little evidence against the null hypothesis that essentially, once you get past the first order autocorrelation that you know should be there because you can't exploit it, there is no uh, exploitable autocorrelation. In, the, uh, in either before or after in sort of the lap prices, which makes sense given that pre, uh, essentially, the implementation of explicit virtual bidding, because uh, loads were, were able to effectively implicit virtual bid at the lap level, you might expect that, uh, you know, they were doing quite a bit of it. Okay, so the, 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 what we do is, we, as we said, we compute these implicit trading costs that we talked about here. And the, the only thing that I think is important to see is that you can see both before versus after virtual bidding, they fall. Meaning that, if you like, the introduction of this product certainly reduced the implicit cost of trading uh, and, and arbitraging these price differences. This just shows what the two distributions look like, the purple uh, being before uh, the whatever that green color is being the after. Then the other thing we look at is we say, okay, Let's look at the distribution of, if you like, the difference between pre versus post for the cost. So in other words, we can use those two distributions that we got, the distribution of the trading charge before, the distribution of the trading charge after, and we can compute the distribution of the difference between C pre minus post. And what we can do is then construct a test of whether or not the null hypothesis that essentially the trading charge before minus post is greater than zero. And what we find is essentially for San Diego Gas and Electric and for SCE, we certainly reject the null uh, that, 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 that essentially this is true, and we don't reject this null, which is, and in both cases, we, in, if you like in PG&E, we don't, we don't reject either, which would say that at least we have no evidence against the null that you know, trading charges uh, fell after the introduction of convergence bidding. Okay, so then the other thing we look, we, we look at, we talked about, is this idea of the variance. So what we do is we say, okay, we've got the variance covariance matrix of the day ahead versus real time price differences. And our hypothesis test is that the difference between pre that variance covariance minus post is a positive semi definite matrix. Essentially, this just amounts to a multivariate nonlinear inequality constraints test of the elements of the 24 eigenvalues. And, and what we do is, 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 is we use essentially moving block bootstraps approach to do that. And what you can see is we do it both ways. So we first do it pre minus post the positive definite matrix, post minus pre is a positive definite matrix. And these are essentially the, the, the p values. And so what you can see is for pre minus post in all cases, for the price difference, we can't reject the null that essentially pre minus post is a positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, and, and for real time price, we also can't reject it. And then for essentially the other way, all of them we can reject it at a 0.05 level, except again for 
Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, there appears to be uh, it, it, the p-value is certainly bigger than 0 0.05. So it certainly is consistent with explicit virtual bidding reducing price volatility. Okay, so the other thing we do is this idea that we talked about, we do things at the nodal level, and at the nodal level you can see that we say, okay, post explicit virtual bidder, we'd expect that it falls after the introduction of virtual bids, the generation node indicator negative, meaning that we said, remember we said that at the generation node, we'd expect the trading cost to be smaller, and then the other thing is we'd expect is that after you introduce explicit virtual bidding, you can do it at any node so that the gap should close. And what we see is essentially exactly what we'd expect in that where you can see that post explicit virtual bidding, the trading charge falls, that's the minus 3.527, and then after you implement it, you can see that the gen node and the uh, post explicit virtual bid coefficient are not statistically different. Their sum is not statistically different from zero, which means that after you implement explicit virtual bidding, there's no systematic difference between uh, the cost at gen nodes versus load nodes. Okay, so in the interest of getting to this, I'll skip to here. So what we did here is we're looking at market performance. So what we did is for each hour, we compute the total variable cost to essentially operating all California ISO generation units using the price of natural gas, the spot price of natural gas for, for that day. We took the total amount of heat energy that was used to produce that power, including the cost of starting up the units in terms of heat energy, and then we had total starts. And then we said, okay, we, 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 we want to control for essentially the composition of how the output is being produced. So we're controlling for in-state renewables, uh, imports, natural gas prices. And then we run that sort of non-parametrically. So everything in the Z is essentially done non-parametrically. And then we have essentially in the Ws just things that include hour, day, and month of year fixed effects. And then essentially, in some specifications, X is just this indicator that says pre versus post explicit virtual bidding. And we used essentially Robinson's semi-parametric estimation procedure with the uh, cross-validating to choose the age. And what we get is roughly about, uh, for the same composition of output, roughly 6% less energy is used pre versus both explicit virtual bidding. And, it's, and then total cost is roughly the same. The interesting thing is, is so that I like to say is that you know this is not small, 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 small potatoes. Roughly about thirty million dollars annually in terms of savings of total variable cost of operating and a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So traders are not only cost efficient but they're environmentally friendly. Uh, so and this just shows how how essentially the effect differs across hours of the day. And the big thing that I think is interesting is, is that certainly one of the things that the ISO operators talked about was essentially this idea of managing the so-called morning ramp. And what you can see is that, is that the big savings appear to be coming during those early morning hours of the day relative to the later hours of the day. So um, this is basically the, the, the end is to say that what we've got is essentially looking at how has financial market participants benefited market performance. Essentially it's by essentially reducing that cost of, 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 of uh, implicit trading costs associated with trading the difference between day ahead and real time prices, which has then led to essentially this lower volatility in real time, lower volatility in the difference between day ahead and real time. And then moreover, this reduced cost of dispatching the system, reduced amount of heat energy needed to essentially produce the same, if you like, composition of, of, uh, of output in, in, in California. So, um, you know, financial market participants can benefit market efficiency, I think, in a market design to allow them to do that. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>